<laughs> oh, yes, please go right ahead. All right, hello everybody and welcome to back to the Queen's Physics Colloquium series. Uh, and for those who might be joining us from further afield, welcome to our colloquium series. Before we start, I would like to begin by acknowledging that while we are not meeting in person in Queen's campus, which is what we would have liked uh, for this colloquium, uh, both Queen's and the city that it's based in, Kingston, Ontario, are on the Cataraque, which are the ancestral lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee nations. Moreover, our speaker is joining us from Boston, which stands on the territory of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts peoples. We want to recognize that both regions are significant to the many indigenous nations of Turtle Island, North America, that have lived or continue to live in these spaces, and we are very honored to be able to gather virtually to meet together from uh, whatever region we happen to reside in. Personally, I am a descendant of settlers, uh, and my family arrived to Turtle Island to escape hardships, and I have benefited from the colonial process that removed indigenous people from their lands uh, and also sought to erase these identities. I'm only really starting to reflect on my own privilege to be here uh, and my gratitude to be here and to call these lands home, uh, especially if you happen to be in Kingston on this beautiful sunny day. Uh, I don't know if how many of you have seen the frozen lake, but sunlight hitting the frozen lake with those ice sheets is really beautiful. So I encourage all of you to appreciate these lands and to take a moment after our colloquium uh, to uh, look at where you live, appreciate the beauty and the history, uh, and to uh, learn a little bit more about decolonization through resources like nativeland.ca. All right, uh, so as I said, our visitor is joining us from Boston. Uh, and this is Professor uh, Catherine Espayet, and I welcome her from Boston University to give our uh, colloquium today. Uh, Professor uh, Espayat gave, uh, got her PhD from the University of Michigan. From there, she was a NSF postdoc and a NASA Sagan fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics before moving across the river to Boston University where she has been a faculty member uh, ever since. She's had an incredibly illustrious career. Uh, just to highlight a few things, she received an NSF Career Award and a Sloan Research uh, Fellowship, which if you're not familiar with those, these are prestigious early career awards given to people recognized as outstanding new faculty. So they're very, very important. And I would like to also mention that um, she has the founded a very important um, group called the League of Underrepresented Minor, Mi Mi Minorized Astronomers, uh, also known as LUMA, um, which uh, if you wish to know a little bit more about, I'm sure uh, after the, the talk, she'd be more than happy to share with graduate students. We'll be encouraged to continue to stay on the call to talk with um, Professor Espayat uh, afterwards. But today she's gonna talk about the field that she is an expert in, which is the formation of stars, the formation of planets, disks, and multi-wavelength observations. So without any uh, more introduction, thank you, Catherine, for being here. It is a pleasure to welcome you virtually to our campus, and I very much look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And I just wanted to spend a couple of seconds um, talking about LUMA since, since, since it was brought up. So LUMA is for those who self-identify as Black, Indigenous, Latinx women. And um, if you're, and we're international, so, and, and, and we um, recruit graduate students, postdocs, research scientists, faculty um, in astronomy and physics and also earth science, like so the, the physical sciences. Um, so if you're interested, um, you can shoot me um, a message, a private message in the chat, or you can send me an email or we hang out till after the talk um, and we'll talk about getting you uh, in, involved in LUMA. All right, so uh, like I said, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here virtually. I wish I could be in person and see this beautiful lake uh, that was described, but thanks for the visual, Sarah. I can, I can imagine it in my mind. I'll have to Google it later. Uh, sounds beautiful. Um, so I do have my chat box open right in front of me. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat box um, or you can unmute yourselves if, if you want to ask me a question. Um, 
this is my first time talking about this particular result because it just came out a couple months ago. So if you don't understand something, it's me, not you. So please do ask questions. That also gives me good feedback for how to uh, improve this talk going forward. So uh, I'll be talking about young uh, baby stars, so one million year old stars uh, that haven't reached the main sequence. We call those pre-main sequence stars, they're still forming. And the particular name for these objects is Titari stars. So you'll be hearing me throw around the term Titari star uh, throughout the presentation. So these Titari stars, um, as shown here in this beautiful image, uh, they're surrounded by protoplanetary disks. And they're still accreting material via their magnetic field lines, um, so they're still growing. So planets are forming in the protoplanetary disk, and the star is also still growing by accumulating material from the surrounding protoplanetary disk. So as, as shown here in this image, um, simulations predict that matter accretes via uh, stellar magnetic field lines and onto the stellar surface. And here I'll be discussing in particular, um, it's not shown here, well, I guess if you squint, you can kind of see it, the, the hot spot that's on the stellar surface. So I'll be talking about that uh, in, in a lot of detail today. Uh, so I'll start off first with an overview um, before I get down to those uh, nitty gritty details. So, and I'll be talking about how we can use multi-wavelength observations as a tool to understand this very small spot on the surface of the star. And I'll show that for one particular star that we looked at, we, we detected this accretion um, hot spot on the surface, and we all, were also able to discern that there is um, there are differences in density along the, the diameter of this hot spot on the surface, and which confirms theoretical predictions. So first, uh, I'll start off, so I've structured my talk um, to answer these three questions. First, I'll discuss what we find in our data set. It's a, it's a coordinated multi-wavelength data set that we took over a month for one Titari star, one young star. Then I'll move on um, and uh, talk about how we compared, uh, how we use modeling so how we use modeling to, to reproduce the data set and how we conclude from that that the observed features that we see um, in our data set are evidence of this change, a, a density gradient in the accretion hotspot on the stellar surface. And then I'll conclude with uh, prospects for following this up in the future. Okay, so first, a, a quick background on accretion in these young systems. So you have your young star, it's surrounded by a protoplanetary disk, and this disk goes out to hundreds of AU, uh, astronomical units, and the disk is made up of dust and gas. And somehow, the dust and gas in the disk move inwards towards the star, and we're not sure exactly how this happens. Um, so it's still an active area, active area of research, but we do see is observational evidence that this material does make it onto the surface of the star. And I'll be talking about that observational evidence in this talk. So. Getting back to the schematic, um, we have um, at, at the point on the disk where the temperature becomes too hot for dust to exist, we have what we call a hot dust wall. Inward of this hot dust wall, you just have gas because it's too hot for dust. You have gas moving inwards towards the star, and it's truncated by the stellar magnetic field. And these young stars have pretty strong magnetic field strengths of one to two kilogauss which should be strong enough to truncate the, the gas disk. So gas is channeled from the inner gaseous disk onto the star via the magnetic field lines in, in what we call accretion flows. And then this material shocks on the stellar surface, forming what we call an accretion shock. At the base of the accretion flow is a hot spot on the stellar surface, not shown here, um, but I will show it later on. And uh, the observables that we get from the accretion process, from the magnetospheric accretion flow, we get broad UV optical emission lines. And then from the accretion shock on the stellar surface, we get continuum emission in the UV and optical because the accretion shock is very hot, has temperatures of eight to 10,000 Kelvin. And then these systems also have, they also eject material to conserve angular momentum in the form, and they eject the material in the form of disk winds and jets. Okay, so I want to spend a little bit of time clarifying terminology that I'll be using in this presentation. So um, we'll we'll see these. Each of these images is going to show up again later in the talk, where I'm going to describe them in a lot more detail. Here, I'm just giving a quick overview. So 
when I say accretion flow, I'm referring to this structure here, arc-like structure. It connects the disk to the star, and this is where the material, the, the gas in the disk is um, channeled onto the star. So that's the accretion flow. The accretion column, which is a structure, an example structure is depicted here. I'll talk about this in more detail later. That's at the very base of the accretion flow. It's called the column because very close to the star, we think it, it becomes collimated. Um, and then at the base of the accretion column, which is the base of the accretion flow, is the accretion hotspot on the surface of the star. Okay. So you can think of the accretion hotspot, and I'll talk later about how it has the shape and what these different colors mean, but um, you can think of the accretion hotspot as the footprint of accretion on the surface of the star, and above that is the accretion column, and above that is the accretion flow. So those are the three terms that I'll be using to describe um, the accretion structures on, on um, yeah, the accretion structures. And then the, um, I'll be focusing about uh, today talking about how we can use UV data, ultraviolet data, and optical data to learn more about the accretion hotspot on the stellar surface. Okay, so I said that accretion in Titari stars occurs via the magnetic field lines, and this was only very recently confirmed. It was it was the paradigm, and we thought it was the most likely mechanism, but it was, it was just recently confirmed um, a couple of years ago um, using spectral interferometry of the closest Titari star, TW Hydra, which is located 60 parsecs from us. So these are observations of the bracket gamma line. It's an infrared line, and it's an infrared line that's known to trace the accretion flow, that arc-like structure. And with the, the resolution of these of these data, they can place the um, origination of sorry my curse is going all over the place. Um, they, they can place the origination of this bracket gamma line as coming from within 3.5 times the stellar radius, and that's important because we know that the dust sublimation radius, that hot wall, is located at 7.5 stellar radii. So. This was the first confirmation that this emission from accretion is coming from a very compact, um, it's not coming from the disk, it's coming from a very compact area around the star that's consistent with what we would expect to see um, the stellar magnetosphere where it'd be accreting material from. So um, magnetospheric accretion onto these uh, low mass stars, the Titari stars, has been confirmed. Now, the further details of how um, is the accretion column and the hot spot structured, that's not clear. So um, and that's something that uh, I'll show you later is something that we, we, we think we uncovered with our observations for the hot spot. So here are some uh, scenarios that have been proposed for the structure of the accretion column. And remember, the hot spot is the footprint of the accretion column on the star. So the structures we see in the column would translate to the hot spot. So some have proposed that we have a accretion column that has one single density, or that it has a density gradient where it's denser in the center and becomes less dense towards the edges, or that you have multiple smaller columns, and each of these columns has its own unique density or that you have a column with vertical stratification. So the material is kind of arriving uh, kind of blob-like. So theoretical simulations, uh, MHD simulations of accretion, they favor the scenario where the accretion column has a density gradient where it's denser towards the center and becomes less dense towards the edges. And here's an example of um, an MHD simulation of accretion where you have the star, in yellow, the magnetic field are, is the red, are the red lines, and these contours here are the accretion flow, the arc-like structure that I, sh I showed you before in the schematics. And here, omega is the stellar rotation axis, and mu is the magnetic rotation uh, axis. And I'll be talking about later how we measure the angle between these two. It's called the misalignment angle. Okay, so, so that's the MHD simulation. Here in the middle panel, we're seeing a top-down view, so looking down at the, at the north pole of, of the star, and the gas and the disk are in green here. The gas and the disk is in green. And then what you see in the rightmost panel is the accretion hotspot on the stellar surface in this simulation. And you can see that it has, so here it's color-coded red to be the densest part. And as you're going from orange, yellow to uh, green, you're going less, the density is decreasing. So you can see the hot spot has a bow shape. It's um, bent around the magnetic axis and it has a density structure. 
So work has been done at the X-ray wavelengths, trying to measure the, the density of the accretion column and the hotspot, in particular using these uh, neon nine and oxygen seven lines. Um, so neon nine is thought to come from hotter temperatures and therefore a denser region, and oxygen six, seven is thought to come from a lower temperature and a less dense region. Um, the issue though is that um, when we look at the accretion column structure, the X-rays would only be should only be coming from the outermost shell of the accretion column. So these observations, X-ray observations, wouldn't be sensitive to the bulk of the material in the accretion column in the hot spot. Um, so they're not sensitive to the radial density distribution. And also there's expected to be a, a contribution from the stellar corona, which emits in the X-ray um, to these lines. So that also would have to be disentangled. So uh, most of the accretion energy is observed in the UV and the optical. And these wavelengths do trace most of the hotspot emission. So if you want to learn more about the hotspot, looking at the UV and the optical should help. Um, and uh, that's what we did for our study. And before we get to that, I just wanted to show you some uh, UV and optical observations of Titari stars that motivated us to go and collect optical light curves. So um, Titari stars have been observed in the UV and the optical, and they're known to be highly variable. And this variability has been linked to accretion. On the left here, we have three Titari stars. Um, each different colored spectrum is an HST spectrum spanning the FUV to the near infrared. And I've highlighted here the near ultraviolet and UV because that's where the bulk of the accretion energy comes out. And you can see that the spectra, each time that these objects were observed, were at a slightly different place. And that's because the continuum emission is changing because accretion, the amount of accretion on the star is changing and therefore the amount of NUV emission coming out is changing. So all of this variability, we can explain it as due to accretion. Um, and this is work that was led by my former graduate student, Connor Robinson, who is now a fellow at um, Amherst. And he's uh, working on expanding this data set. Um, okay, so then on the right, what we have here is uh, accretion variability seen in optical light curves. So the left are spectra and the right is uh, our light curve. So repeatedly taking optical observations. And this is coming from um, a big survey called YSOVAR where they looked at 500 targets. And then they found that the most of the light curves could be classified into um, two different morphologies, which are attributed to accretion variability. And I'm just highlighting two samples here, stochastic and bursters. So just to show you that uh, these objects do have a lot of accretion variability, and you can see that in the UV and the optical. So that's a good place to look if you want to learn more about the accretion hotspot. OK, so on to more details about our study. So we focused on one Titari star because we wanted to get a lot of data. Um, so we focused on one Titari star, and this Titari star is called Giamaregi, and we chose it for several reasons. First, it's a low mass star. And as I showed a bit earlier, magnetospheric accretion has been confirmed as the way in which low mass stars accrete. Um, in the more massive stars, which are easier to observe, the Herbig AEBE stars, um, it's not clear how they accrete because they have weaker magnetic fields. So even though um, Herbig stars are brighter, the accretion mechanism is understood. So we didn't want one of those stars. So we picked a low mass uh, t Tarni star. And then here, what I'm showing is an ALMA image. And um, it, it's, it's hard to discern here if you're not a millimeter expert. But basically, uh, this is the signature that you see here, kind of this donut shape. Um, that, that's telling us that we have a hole in the disk. So Giamaragi is what's called a transitional disk. It has a big hole of about 20 AU in radius in its disk, where it doesn't have uh, any, where it doesn't have significant amounts of dust. Uh, dust. And we wanted this because we don't want dust, because we don't want dust to obscure the star and introduce any extra variability. We want the variability to be due to accretion in our data set. Um, uh, even though there's a big hole in the dust, there, there, uh, I'll show you in a bit, um, we know that there's accretion happening in this system. So we also picked Giamaragi because it has a jet, which can be detected in the centimeter wavelengths. So in addition to accretion onto the star, it's possible, there's a possibility of studying ejection from the star. 
And then here is the, is the plot showing accretion variability in this system. So here again, highlighting the NUV data from HST STIS. Uh, you see that there's variability, it's changing. And so even though there's a big hole in the dust, there's a lot of gas uh, accreting onto the star and we know it's variable. So it's a well-studied uh, well studied object for, for accretion variability. So that's why we picked this object. Okay, so what was our data set? So this chart overviews the observations that we got in our multi-wavelength uh, campaign. The observatories and the data sets are on the left and uh, on the y-axis and the, the dates that we got this in 2019, uh, basically the month of December, are, um, the dates are noted on the bottom. So the data set includes uh, SWIFT space telescope data, X-ray and NUV fluxes, uh, Hubble Space Telescope spectrum, with similar, very similar to what I showed you before, NUV spectra, Las Cumbres Observatory Global Telescope data, so LCOGT. This is a worldwide um, network of, of small telescopes, which you can use remotely to, to observe uh, via Q-mode. And um, we got uh, photometry at U prime, G prime, R prime, and I prime. We also got uh, photometry with TESS in the optical. So TESS is a space telescope. It's looking for um, exoplanets, but it's doing all sky surveys. So Titari stars are bright, so they also fall in the field of view. We got data with Chiron, which is a spectrometer, and we got H-alpha optical emission lines with Chiron. We observed with ALMA, which is a millimeter interferometer, and we got um, millimeter CO emission lines. And then with the VLA, we observe the centimeter continuum. So I'll be returning to each of these data sets and talking about them in detail. I just want to give you a sense of the data that we collected. Um, when possible, data were taken once a day. This was, um, this was motivated by the rotation period of the star, which is about six days. Test data were taken every two minutes. Um, and LCOGT data were taken about every uh, about three to five times per night. And then HST data, we got this for about one once per day for a week, um, again, motivated by the rotation period of the star. So HST data are very expensive to get, so we couldn't get more than a week. And then the gaps in the data set um, that are not, that are spaced out by more than a day, they're due to poor weather or scheduling constraints. Okay, so the wavelengths covered by the data set trace different parts of the star disk system. The X-ray emission traces emission from the stellar corona. The NUV and optical data, so the, the um, yeah, we, that's the bulk of our data set, that traces the accretion shock on the stellar surface and therefore the resulting hot spot, which isn't shown here, and then also the, the stellar photosphere. And we do find significant variability in the NUV through optical data, and that's what I'll be focusing on. And I forgot to mention for the X-ray, we didn't see any variability, so I'm, I'm just not going to cover that. And then we did get H-alpha data, H-alpha uh, optical emission lines, and that's coming from the accretion flow. Um, and I'll show you later how we utilize that data set. We, and then the ALMA data, that's tracing the gas in the outer disk, so tens of AU from the star. And the centimeter emission is tracing the jet emission. So we find no significant variability in the radio emission. But since there are some radio astronomers in the audience, and since this is the first time this is very radio variability has been studied in Titari stars, um, I just have one slide to, to show you the data. So it's a non-result, but uh, I figure I should just I should just show it. Um, so here we have the common uh, CO tracers, 13 CO and C18O. Uh, we find no significant variability. What we're plotting here is the C18O is, is the line to continuum flux ratios. Uh, for the 13 CO and the C18 O. And we do line to continuum flux ratio, so we don't have to worry if there's any variability of the continuum. There shouldn't be, but just to be sure, we don't have to worry about that. Um, and then the points are plotted with their uncertainties. The solid line is the mean of the observations. Um, I'm sorry, the, the mean um, uncertainties. And then the broken lines are one sigma. Uh, just to show you that there's no significant variability. We did do some, some tests with our disk chemistry models running simulations, and we find that if, in order to see variability in millimeter at these lines for t tardy stars, um, you would need an increase in the FUV, um, or a significant increase in FUV or X-ray luminosity. 
Um, and that increase must last about 100 years in order to induce changes. So it's very implausible that we'd be able to see this in a Titari star. However, there are some stars called FU Ori's EX ORs, which have explosive events that, um, accretion events that last hundreds of years. And perhaps those are objects to try to come up with ways of testing if we can detect millimeter variability in these lines. But for Titari stars, I think it's, it's um, uh, at least we, we, I think we can say that we don't expect um, variability due to accretion, uh, changes in the X-ray or the, the FUV, the UV, um, due to the, um, to change the, 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 the gas lines. Okay. So then here on the bottom panel is the centimeter emission taken by the VLA, and this traces jet emission. Again, the what's plot is very is similar to the to the top two. Um, and then this shows that the typical changes that we see in the accretion rates of TTRA stars. Um, so the changes in accretion rate that we saw while we were observing GMRI, that, sh that shouldn't lead to detectable changes in the mass loss rate that's um, that's tracing the jet at these centimeter wavelengths. Okay, so now let's move on to what did change. So uh, in the next few slides, I'll be showing that there are two observed features that we see in the UV and the optical light curve, um, and that we interpret these as evidence of density, a density gradient in the accretion hotspot. And the two features, um, just I'm going to keep repeating this because it's a lot of data set. The first feature is a time lag between the UV and the optical light curves. And the second is a, a simultaneous dip that's observed in the UV through optical light curves. OK, so here are the light curves that uh, we obtained for GMRI. So we have the NUV, U prime, G prime, TESS, R prime, and I prime. Um, and uh, that's coming from SWIFT, LCOGT is the SWIFT is giving us the NUV flux, LCOGT is giving us the U prime and G prime, we have tests in between, and then LCOGT is again giving us the R prime and the I prime. And uh, just um, as an aside, the test bandpass is very broad, it's a very broad optical filter, and it covers both the R, R prime and the I prime, so those are very similar light curves. And the uncertainties here are smaller than the symbols. Okay, so you can see that there are um, daily changes in the light curve, and those peaks that you see, some of, sometimes are clearer than others, depending on the how dense the light curve is. Those peaks are about six days apart, which is consistent with the 6.1 day rotation period of GMRI um, that has been uh, measured before. And so this is evidence of rotational modulation. So there's something on the surface of the star that's rotating in and out of view. And in this case, it's, it's a hot spot. Okay, so here I've highlighted for the top three panels, the peaks in the UV light curves. And then um, here for the next one, um, I've highlighted in green, the peaks in the, um, the optical light curves, TESS, R prime and I prime. Now, each of these boxes is separated by six days, which is the rotation period of the star. And what's noticed is that you, what is interesting is that you notice there's a shift. The, the three boxes on the bottom panels are shifted by a day compared to the boxes on the top panels. Okay, so it's interesting that the optical light curves peak, peak a day later than the UV light curves. Now, this can be explained by density structure in the hot spot. So material slams onto the star and leaves a hot spot on the stellar surface. The UV, the, the high density part of the hot spot emits at higher temperatures and therefore shorter wavelengths. So that's giving you UV emission. And then the, the less dense part of the hot spot, the greenish, bluish parts, that emits at um, lower temperatures, so longer wavelengths in the optical. And if I click on this, you can see that as the star is rotating, Parts of the different parts of the hot spot will come into and out of view, and there are times when the high density part is completely hidden uh, from our view, but you can still see other parts of the hot spot. And I'll show this in more detail um, later on. But um, I just wanted to to give an overview that the time lag and the peaks between the UV and the optical. Um, this is the first observational evidence that we have of a density gradient in the hot spot on the stellar surface. And I'll be digging in more detail, comparing this in more detail to MHD simulations in a couple of slides. Okay. 
<laughs> video keeps wanting to be played. Okay, so then I told you the second uh, feature that we observed is a simultaneous dip in all of the light curves. So here I've highlighted the dip in gray. Um, it occurs on December 23rd through the 25th. Um, there's another dip that we see in the test light curve around December 21 to 22, but it's actually very narrow and none of our other data sets have um, observations at the same time. So it's only seen in the, in the test light curve. We didn't catch it in the other data sets. But for this second dip, you see the beginning of it in the test light curve and you see all of it in the other light curves. You see it go down and you see it go up. So like I said, we picked GMRIG so that it has this big hole in the, in the dust distribution because we didn't want obscuration due to dust. Uh, we don't want dust extinction. So this um, this dip isn't due to dust extinction. Uh, what's interesting is if you look at the UV data, um, it, this one we don't have enough data sets, but here, uh, I mean data points, but if you look at the U prime light curve, you see there are these strong peaks. Uh, here we don't have that much data, but you see at least three strong peaks, and then after this dip, the peaks go away. You'd expect to see the peak peaks six days later, but they're not there. And so what this is telling us is that um, the high density part of the hotspot um, has gone away because you still see um, peaks in the in the other light curves, but just not the, the U prime data set. And this can also be explained by um, a density gradient in the accretion spot on the stellar surface. So the these high density regions according to the simulations are expected to be unstable and sometimes they can go away completely so it could be possible that at, while we were observing gm Rangi over the month the it's, there was an accretion event that happened that caused some instability and that the high density part of the hot spot went away and so we don't see it after this dip in the light curve okay so those are the two observables that we saw, the time lag between the peaks, the dip in the light curves. I gave you a, a broad overview of how we can explain those with simulations. Now I'm going to go into more details of, about the simulations, the models, comparing them to the data, um, explaining how we can see, exp um, showing you how we can explain both with this density gradient in the hot spot on the stellar surface. So first I start off with are models of the accretion shock, um, the accretion column on the surface of the star. And I'll show you how um, the from the accretion shock modeling, looking at the accretion column and the resulting hot spot on the surface, we find that the UV light curves are indeed dominated by the high density part of the hot spot, and that the optical part is dominated by the low density part of the hot spot. So we confirm uh, with the modeling that these different parts of the hot spot are emitting at different um, wavelengths. So first, what model are we using? So we're using the accretion shock model of Calvet and Goldring, which is uh, has been used to reproduce a lot of these um, NUV through optical observations of young stars to get accretion rates. This is the schematic I showed you earlier. This is the, the structure of the accretion column that's used in this model, where you have the shock, you have the pre-shock above it, the post-shock and the, the heated photosphere. The material is coming from the top down, and we're assuming that the material is highly collimated and we're very close to the surface of the star. Um, and then rem just a reminder, the top of this accretion column is being fed by the accretion flow, which is the arc-like structure connecting the disk and the star. And then at the bottom of this accretion column is the hot spot. So the accretion shock, um, accretion column model, um, I use the, the, we use these terms interchangeably. Um, it generates uh, emission in the NUV and the optical, but where the emission peaks depends on the density of the material. So on the right, we have three models with accretion columns of different densities. So um, this one, so here the red, it, it's this is the emission, this is the a, a model that has the highest density, and you can see it peaks at the shortest wavelength, so it's peaking in the NUV. And then this purple um, line here is a simulated spectrum, and it has a lower density, the lowest density, and you can see that it's peaking at the longer wavelengths out towards the, the near infrared. And then the middle column, the, the middle density column um, um, emits uh, peaks in between those two. Okay, so here is all of the HST data that we got and our fits to it. 
Um, there's a lot going on here. In the next slide, I'll show you the parameters we extract from these models. But first, I just want to show you the actual fits that we did. So um, there, so the black lines are the actual HST data. Remember, we got those for one week during the month of our observations. So one, two, three, four, five. Oh, we got five um, spectra because one of the um, one of the one of the observations failed. There was an issue with STIS, and so we didn't get that sixth observation. Uh, we wanted to get one per day of the rotation period. So we have five. But um, um, the best fit total model is the red line that fits the, the observed data in black. And then that total model, the red sodden line, is composed of the other broken lines in the plot. So the blue is a template stellar photosphere. So this is just a young Tari star that doesn't have any accretion. And then the broken dashed lines here, um, those are um, accretion columns of different densities. And, um, uh, and then you can see that the fits to the data are, are pretty good. So from these best fits to the data, we can measure different properties of the accretion column and the resulting hotspot. And what we're interested in here, which I'll show you in the next slide more graphically, is the total energy flux, um, the density, and the size of the hotspot. Okay, so on to the next slide. So here I'm focusing, um, so the top two panels are the test light curve and the U prime light curve, so the optical and the UV light curves, but just focusing on that one week, so one peak. Of, of, of the entire month, uh, just where we got the HST data for that one week. The third panel here shows the total energy flux of the accretion column that we get by fitting the data, the HST data. And then the fourth panel here breaks that down into the fraction of the energy flux, so the fraction of the total energy flux that's coming from the low density region in the triangles and the high density region in the, uh, in the circles. So what we see is that when the U prime data peaks, so the UV data, when that peaks, there's a peak in the emission from the high density um, component of the hotspot. And then the low density region, um, it dominates on, on all days because uh, it's just bigger. Uh, but then the high density component, it drops significantly after um, December 8th. Um, and the, the fact that this aligns with the peak shows that the high density part of the hotspot is um, is giving emission in the in the UV. Okay, and then what about the low density part of the hotspot? So we can get at that by looking at the um, the size of the region of the hotspot. So same the two the top two panels here are the same as on the left. The third panel here on the right is the size of the hotspot, which we get by fitting the HST data. And then here on the bottom is the fraction of the hotspot that's due to the low density region in the triangles and the high density region in the circles. So the, hot, the size of the hotspot, which is dominated by the low density emission, that peak here agrees with the peak that we see in the optical. Um, so this is showing that the optical data is tracing the low density part of the hotspot. Um, okay, so that's um, so. So this is the the observables that we got, and this is showing us that the hot the high density part of the hotspot dominates the UV emission, the UV light curve, and then the low density part of the hotspot dominates the optical emission. Okay. So now um, we're going to compare to MHD simulations of accretion, and we're going to see that the MHD simulations. Uh, predict that there should be a time lag in the light curves between the high density um, component of the hotspot emission and the low density component of the um, hotspots emission. And that also that the MHD simulations predict that the high density emission should um, disappear because the high density part of the hotspot is unstable. Okay, so first let's go through the simulation setup. So we used global 3D MHD simulations of a rotating magnetized star that's accreting from a disk. And here's the 3D view of that. So magnetic field lines are red, the gas is in blue, the star is in yellow. Now the star, the, the, the models assume that the star has a dipole magnetic field. And you can see here a side view of that. The rotation axis of the star is omega and the magnetic rotation angle axis of the star is mu. 
And then the angle between these two, which is not shown as theta, and that's the misalignment angle, and that's going to come up again in a couple of slides. I'll repeat that. Um, and here is the, the side view, and then this is a top-down view. And then here is the resulting hot spot. So as you saw earlier, it's bow-shaped, crescent-shaped. It's bent around the magnetic pole, which is mu, um, and it has a density gradient. So to compare the, our observations to simulations, we had to pick simulations that um, are most similar to the observed parameters of GMRIG. And these MHD simulations take months to run. Um, and so we went through the simulations that had been pro uh, published previously by Blanova et al. in 2005. And so we picked the ones with the parameters most similar to GMRIG. So I just want to spend a minute um, telling you which parameters are the most important for these simulations and what are they What are they for GMRIG? What do we measure them? So the simulations show that the properties of the hot spot depend on theta, which is that misalignment angle between the stellar rotation axis and the magnetic rotation axis. And then also the magnetospheric radius, which sets the size of the magnetic field. Um, so that was the, um, I showed you very early on that confirmation of magnetospheric accretion with the bracket gamma line. So that's what we want to get at. What's the size of the, the magnetosphere? So the theta, the misalignment angle of GMRIG is about 13 degrees. And we got this from the literature from McGinnis et al. And um, um, they, so McGinnis et al. measured the, the, the latitude of the hot spot of GMRIG. So they measured that's about at 77 degrees. And then from that, you can get out the, the misalignment angle is 13 degrees. And they got that by using the H alpha line. Um, so this is a, a detail of um, they used the star's projected rotational velocity, V sine I, and then um, they got the, the misalignment angle from that. And then we measured the magnetospheric radius to be about four times the stellar radius using the H alpha observations. I told you we got Chiron H alpha line profiles of GMRIG throughout um, our campaign. The data are in black, the fits are in red, and the, the model that we're using to fit the data is the magnetospheric accretion flow model. So I showed you this uh, schematic earlier. So here we're talking about the arc-like structure. So we have a, a model that reproduces the emission from this, and um, we can measure the size of the magnetosphere, um, and we can vary that to get what best fits the, pro the H alpha profile. And from doing that, we got uh, a stellar radius, I mean, a magnetospheric radius of four times the stellar radius. And the simulations use, um, that we're comparing to here use a theta of 20, so uh, very similar, and a magnetospheric radius of 4.5. So again, very similar to GMRIG. Okay, so here on the left is the are the light curves that the simulations predict that are being generated by the hotspot. So a low density region of the hotspot dominates the optical emission, that's this um, solid um, curve here. And the high density part of the hotspot generates this broken line here. And what you can see is that both light curves are modulated by the stellar rotation period. Um, the, um, and then you also can see a time lag. So here in particular, you see that the, the high density emission peaks first, and then the optical peaks, you see that again over here, the high density emission um, peaks first, and the, the low density emission, the optical peaks later. So this can explain the time lag between the curves. You can you also see that sometimes there is no peak from the high density component, um, where you do see a peak from the low density component, and that's due to uh, what I was saying earlier, that the high density component is unstable. And this right panel here, uh, this is um, simulations focusing on the central peak here around three times the stellar rotation period. And um, I'm going to step through each one now. Okay, so this um, simulation here corresponds to this broken line here. So we're starting off at the bottom of the peak, and this is 2.6 times um, 2.6 p star, the stellar rotation period. So you can see both uh, parts of the, uh, so you can see par some parts of the low density and high density part of the um, hot spot. Now we're at, at 2.69 p star, you see more of both parts. So you're seeing the light curve goes up. Um, here, 
you see more, um, you see all, you see most of both of the components um, of the, the high density and the low density components of the hotspot, but the high density component of the hotspot is more along um, your li our line of sight. And so we're getting that the high density like curve, um, high density components like curve peak is peaking first. And then again, we see all of both. Um, and then here, now the high density component is getting further along from our line of sight, while um, more of the large, more of the low density component of the hotspot is along our line of sight. So now you see a peak in the optical light curve. And then here, I'll just step through quickly, you're seeing the hotspot going behind the star, and then you're coming down from the peak. So even more and more is being hidden. So you see very little of the hotspot. Okay, so then, uh, where do we go from here? So we did this for one Titari star, um, and there's a lot of potential for follow-up here, um, particularly uh, using the HST discretionary um, direct, director's discretionary program called Ulysses. So I'll be going you know, a couple slides on that. So the HST director approved a discretionary UV legacy program because HST is the only uh, UV uh, spectrometer that we have, and it's the only one we're going to have until we launch something else into space to replace it. Um, and this program has 1,000 orbits to cement HST's UV legacy uh, while we still have HST, the Hubble Space Telescope. So the, the goal here is to obtain UV spectra for stars. There's a high mass star component uh, of the program and a low mass star component, low mass premium sequence star component. Um, so out of those 1,000 orbits, 500 have been allocated to Titari stars. And um, of that 500 orbits, 400 orbits is going to be used to study about 700 Titari stars, observe them once. And then 100 of those orbits, it's going to be used to study four Titari stars repeatedly for variability. And Giamaregi, which is the, tar the target I was talking about, is one of those four stars. So um, the, the so some data from this has already, from Ulysses for Giamaregi following this up, which I just presented, has been taken. And um, a graduate student in my research group, John Wendingborn, is going through the data set. Um, and then the other half of the data set comes in a few months. So there will be follow up to this um, hotspot uh, work very soon. Now, the Ulysses program is so important uh, for our community that it's unified us into a team called Odysseus. So our team is made up of about 75 young star experts from around the world. And we're working together collaboratively to combine our knowledge and combine our resources to um, work collaboratively on the Ulysses data set from the HST data, but also to gather uh, data at other wavelengths to form a very comprehensive legacy data set for Titari stars. And our team's goals uh, very quickly are to study the accretion flow, to study winds and jets, and to study the FUV radiation field. And then here very quickly are some of the first results from our team, which just to highlight here the wide range of data that we can collect by working together as a community. So the data from Ulysses, the HST program, is here. So we have up to uh, one micron. We have HST data, um, F, uh, UV through optical spectra. And then here we have some FUV um, emission lines and also continuum. So that's the HST data set. Um, for one micron and beyond, we have ground-based um, and um, extruder spectra, which is taken by um, uh, as part of a large VLT program called Penelope, the PI is Carlo Manara. Um, and then here, these are just lines that are fitting the data. Um, but I want you to focus on the data set, how we can complement it. And um, here we have light curves uh, taken at uh, Conkley Observatory, uh, led by Agnes Kospal, also um, amateur astronomers uh, through AAVSO, um, and some other observatories here, Assassin, um, and then the test light curve for this particular object. This, this object is one T star called CVSO 109. Um, not important, just want to um, show data from one object. And, and the black um, spectrum here, this is test data, which was also taken for this object. And then here are H alpha and H beta profiles. So lines that are tracing the accretion flow. 
So again, just showing um, all the data that we could collect as a community. This is the first paper that came out, just overviewing the data set that, and the kind of analysis we can apply to the data. And we have several papers in the pipeline and they'll be coming out later this year. So to summarize, um, we found for the first time observational evidence of density structure, a density gradient in the accretion hotspot on the stellar surface of a young star. We find this um, by looking at UV and optical light curves of one Titari star. They display periodicity, which agrees with stellar rotation period, but they don't peak at the same time. There's a time lag, um, the optical light curves peak a day after the UV. And we applied um, modeling of accretion shock models, magnetospheric flow models, uh, MHD simulations of accretion, uh, to discern that these observational signatures are due to a hotspot with a density gradient where the high density part of the hotspot emits at short wavelengths and that's giving us the uv light curve and the low density part of the hotspot emits at longer wavelengths and that's giving us the optical part of the light curve and there's an offset where the high density part of the uh, is located in the hotspot as opposed to the bulk of the low density material in the hotspot. And so as the, the star is rotating, we see, sometimes we see the hotspot, sometimes we don't as it's going behind the star, different parts of the hotspot go behind the star. Okay, so um, this uh, highlights the what we can get from coordinated multi wing observations. And there's a lot of possibility in the future, especially with Ulysses, for future progress in time domain studies, um, but also with other um, observatories such as TESS um, and other um, like LSST. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity for, for more work with Titari stars and better understanding accretion in these, uh, in these young systems. So thank you very much for, for your time and attention. Awesome, thank you. I, I will applaud on behalf of everyone. There are applauses, of course, happening on Zoom, but you don't get quite the same audio <laughs> sensory experience with a, a virtual talk, of course. Um, I am going to just end recording just uh, right now.